Hello, everyone, and welcome to the School of Taste. I am uh, Nick Jackson. Great to be back with you, and great indeed to start a new course, a new webinar course, uh, this time called A Taste of Europe. Uh, session one today, we are going to look at some German wines, which is always a happy moment for me. Um, the purpose of this webinar course, let's just talk about it at the top, um, you know that I am very interested in theories about wine, about how to taste wine, what to look for in wine, how to describe wine. All these theories, which kind of take some getting used to, I wrote some of them down in my book called Beyond Flavor. You'll be pleased to hear, however, that this course really isn't about any of that kind of stuff. This course is almost, to my mind, a course about the sheer pleasure of tasting wine. We're going to taste a whole bunch of wines together uh, over the course of the next three or four weeks during these webinars. And the aim of the course is very, very simple, to acquaint us with what the taste and style of these wines from Europe is. So I decided to look at the four, what I consider the four most important wine producing countries in Europe by the quality and the volume of wine that they produce, namely Germany, France, Spain, and Italy. And just to look at a few different regions from each one of them. Now, in the later webinars in this course, beginning from next week's session, we will look at different varieties and different regions. But in this first session, I knew I wanted to do something about Germany. But I was thinking, and I was thinking, well, maybe I should talk about German Pinot Noir or Thoyrebo or some other of the white varieties in Germany. But then I just thought, you know what? Germany is the kingdom of Riesling. Um, there are 13 wine producing regions in Germany and every single one of them grows Riesling. So if that's what Germany does, then that's what we're going to do when it comes to Germany. So we're going to talk in this first session about German Riesling. So you are very welcome. If you're watching live, please do use the questions function uh, to send me any comments or questions. And if you're watching on recording, thank you very much for taking the time to do that. So without further ado, let us think first about what we can expect from German Riesling. Um, I mean, first, I suppose, let's just do a little 101 on, on Riesling in general. Um, not that you guys don't know all this already, but you know, generally speaking, I always think the most uh, dominant feature of Riesling is the acidity, um, wherever it's grown, whatever the style of the wine. A moderately aromatic variety. Um, it's not like Sauvignon Blanc or Viognier or something, but still has, is by no means a neutral variety. Um, a variety that can be made in a wide range of styles. And obviously we'll talk about that today from uh, dry to very sweet. Um, a wine usually that doesn't see a ton of wine making, i.e. you don't taste things like oak influence too much. Um, Riesling almost never goes through malolactic fermentation. Um, usually has very rarely has high levels of alcohol so you don't really taste the alcohol often has very low levels of alcohol and that's something which we'll also discuss today um ultimately though a fruity wine um which can usually manage to combine um an innate uh, gentle fruitiness with some kind of savory aspect to it as well which will vary from place to place where it's grown but when it comes to Germany in particular and German expressions of Riesling, the first thing I've written down here um, is about a general statement about the climate of Germany, uh, you know, a northern region in Europe. Um, so we can expect this is really, these are really cool climate wines. I mean, of course, Germany, as everywhere else, is experiencing warmer um, summers, warmer growing seasons. But in general, compared to most other European countries, this is still going to be considered a cool climate region, and the wines reflect that. Um, one of the things that I should point out now before I forget, because it's a really interesting point, and a point that I always like to remember, is that um, the autumn weather in Germany is usually, it's not warm by no means, but it's usually dry, especially in the Mosul region um, and in the surrounding regions. Um, and what that means is that the growing season is extended into the autumn. You don't have to harvest in September. You can harvest in mid-October, late October, even going into November sometimes if you want, because the risk of rain is quite low. 
And so what does that do? Well, it, first of all, it enables you to harvest at different ripeness levels, which is important in the different styles available of Riesling. But perhaps what's more important is that it enables the very gradual development of flavor. Um, if you have um, a climate, for instance, you're in a, maybe you're in a warm to hot climate, either in Southern Europe or in a non-European country, um, you're in California or parts of Australia or, or elsewhere in the new world where it's just very hot at harvest time. It means that the sugars are likely to shoot up very, very quickly when the grapes achieve um, a certain degree of ripeness. And that means you don't really have a choice. You have to harvest at that time. Um, but when the weather's a bit cooler, the sugar goes up more slowly, the flavors develop more incrementally. So German Riesling can often have very filigreed and detailed and complex flavors, I think precisely because you can wait, you can let the grapes hang out on the vine there, knowing that the flavor is gonna develop, but without the sugars going crazy, meaning that you're forced into harvesting. So I think the dry autumn thing is very important. It also happens in the Alsace region, um, a, a key aspect of the style of the wines. Built on acid, of course, that goes hand in hand with where the country is situated, northern climate, high acid wines. Um, associated with that in turn is what I consider to be this very German emphasis on precision and purity of flavor. Um, German, I say, because this isn't just associated with Riesling in Germany, but you also say it with other varieties, uh, with the Pinot Noir, for instance, other white varieties, Weissburgunder, Grauburgunder. German winemakers like to be able to taste every little detail of flavor in their wines. Um, this is what they consider complexity. It's a kind of, um, if any of you like listening to Johann Sebastian Bach, you know, the great 1685, 1750 great composer, Baroque period. He writes organ pieces, organ fugues and preludes and things like that, where there's an almost mathematical intricacy of uh, the different musical lines. In that you can hear every little complexity of the music. And sometimes I think that German reasoning is a bit like that. Um, Trocken to TBA, so we'll talk about that more um, today. German wine is increasingly being made in a dry style. Only something like 30% of German wine has got any residual sugar in it. Um, certainly the warming climate facilitates making dry trocken wines. Um, but for many collectors, especially the um, predicates, the off dry wines um, are still some of the great contributions to the wine world from Germany. Um, minerality, very slippery term, a term that I'm not really always totally at ease with. Like I always say to people when they're describing a wine that tastes of some kind of mineral, you have to qualify it further. You have to tell me what exactly you're tasting. Are you tasting smoke or slate or granite or um, river stones or something else? And to be clear, I don't want people to say, I am tasting the rock on which this grape is grown in this region, because we know that's a tough thing to say from a scientific point of view. Um, but we also do know that in Germany, there does seem to be an expression um, somehow of some kind of rocky minerality that goes on in these wines, um, which is which you can't deny. I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, how it gets to be in the wines, we don't know. But what I do think is important in German Riesling is this, the fact that the, the fruitiness of the Riesling, the native fruitiness of the, of the variety is offset by a, a kind of underlying minerality. And so look out for that today when we're tasting the wines. Limited winemaking influence cool climate. So you don't want to use 100% yew oak because these delicate, precise, pure flavors that I was just talking about will easily be overwhelmed if you use those kind of techniques. And then finally, and this is why I guess we're doing a whole session just on one variety from one country. Um, you know, people always talk about Riesling being a variety which is very sensitive to differences in terroir. Um, and the first and most important of which, to my mind, is always climate. Um, and so I think we will see quite a lot of that today. Um, differences in climate expressing themselves and differences um, in the taste of the wines, but other things as well. Um, in very cool climates, the aspect which way your vineyard faces is going to be crucial. Um, 
unless you have a south facing slopes in some northern parts, it's going to be tough to get the ripeness that you want. Um, and you can see I've listed a few other factors there. Um, but we'll talk about more of those as we go along. Um, okay, so why don't we go ahead and pour the first wine from the Mosul region. Uh, if you have a wine from the Tsar or the Ruva region, that's also now considered for sort of administrative purposes as part of the Mosul region. So why don't we um, go ahead and pour that wine. Uh, and I will just move this slide forward to the Mosul section. Um, the, hello, Tufi. Good to hear from you. Tufi is asking a question. As petrol is of mineral origin, can we call petrol notes in some Rieslings mineral? Well, I sort of understand from the academic side of that question where you're coming from. But I think that we know that the petrol aroma in Riesling is actually a question about the ripeness, or in some cases, the overripeness of the grapes that hang on the vines. And it's not associated with um, soils or anything like that. So um, I think I would rather just, uh, what would I say? Would you? Would I say that petrol is mineral? I think I would just say petrol is petrol or gasoline or whatever word that you'd like to use for that aroma you get in some reasonings. I think I'd rather just call it that and just say those aromas which are often found in some reasonings, especially from warmer vintages where the, sun, the grapes may have been exposed to sunburn or possibly drought. Um, and that has been an issue in recent vintages in Germany where it's been a bit warmer. Um, okay, so what the way this session is going to go is I'm going to show you this slide here about this is what I'm looking for. This is my sort of Mosul 101 about what I'm looking for in the wines. Um, and then for the future regions, um, I'm going to ask you to tell me what you're getting before I show you the slides. So I don't want to give you uh, my ideas until you've told me um, what you're getting. So please smell the first wine, smell, taste the wine that you have. And then I just want you to write in the questions function, something about uh, the style of the wine overall that you're getting. Um, what are the dominant features? What leaps out of the glass at you? Um, what do you think are the most distinctive elements of this wine that are different from other reasonings that you've tasted, either from Germany or from elsewhere? What makes this wine this wine? And when you do that, when you write that sentence for me, then tell me also what style of wine you have, whether it's a trocken, cabinet, whatever it is, because obviously that's going to be relevant too. Uh, Nicole is asking, the expression wet stone is used to, frequently too for minerality, but smoke is different, isn't it? Well, again, what I like to say, I always have, whenever you're describing minerality, I always want you to say something like um, wet stone minerality or smoky minerality, so you're qualifying it. So I think either of those is fine. Um, um, smoky, um, as people who taste with me regularly know, is something that I always associate, in fact, with um, wines from volcanic types of soil. Um, I don't really know why it goes like that, but it does seem to be that way. If you think about um, Alsace Riesling, which we're not tasting today, um, if you think about Suave, um, what are the volcanic regions? I mean, things like uh, Taurasi and um, those southern Italian ones, Etna wines, things like that. If someone says smoky minerality, I know what that means. And I often think that that has a volcanic kind of um, origin. But of course, no science behind that. It's just what I often find. Okay, Amber. Uh, Amber's got a wine from the Saar, the Saar being the furthest west, coolest region, even within the whole overall Mosul um, uh, region. Cool climate citrus with lots of stony minerality. And despite having the highest alcohol of my wines tonight, which is 11.5%, by the way, it definitely feels the lightest. Um, kind of remarkable the more I think about the lightest. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the Saar, so I assume, Amber, by the way, that you say that, that that's a, a, a dry wine, if it's 11.5% um, from the Saar. Um, yeah, absolute lightness of touch in the Saar region. Um, wonderful 
producers there, including my favorite is probably Zillicon. Zillicon, if you like the off dry style of wines, um, they call their entry wine, Zillicon, they call their entry wine butterfly because it's so graceful and light, it almost just touches you, it just kisses you and then it flies away. That's their thinking and it's a very appropriate name. Um, and even their Grosses Gavex, uh, even the dry Grosses Gavex still feels absolute featherweight um, from the Saar region. Um, Peter Lauer is usually a bit more associated with the dry style um, of Saar, another great producer from there. Uh, Kathy has got uh, a linear wine with taut acidity and lime and fresh and light on the palate. Um, Clemens Bush. Clemens Bush is a great, great producer and making very mineral wines. I don't know whether you find that, Kathy. Um, Corey has got a Carl Lurban cabinet. Actually, um, Corey, this photo um, that you're looking at on this slide comes from about a mile away from where the Carl Lurban winery is. Confusingly, the Lurban winery is in a town called Leiven. Um, and this is just on the outskirts of Leiven. Um, beautiful place. This is a photo from last September when I was there. Uh, anyway, the Carl Urban has got bright acidity perfectly balancing the ample orchard fruit. So the orchard fruit's interesting, um, more than just citrus. I think a lot of you guys will be getting citrus in your wine here. Cool region, certainly I think that citrus is the coolest of the, the fruit styles. Um, but what's so wonderful I think about Riesling, these delicate Rieslings from the Mosul, is that they managed to um, have notes above and beyond just that and i think that that is a function of this late flavor development um, in the autumn um Tufi, um with a trocken mosel um delicate floral and apple uh light body moderate 12 percent alcohol just off dry with a high steely vertical acidity very elegant with a medium length and a mineral finish yeah, sounds a pretty textbook example, Tufi. Um, that sounds pretty delicious as well. Um, Edgar, by the way, just uh, a note on Tufi's wine. So Amber's Saar wine was 11.5%. Um, and Tufi, um, Tufi's Trocken is 12%. Um, so just think about how low those alcohols are for what are basically dry wines. They wouldn't be analytically. They'd probably have, you know, nine grams or a little less, but that's what they called themselves, trock and dry. Um, we'll talk about that point about alcohol in just a sec. Uh, Edgar, um, JJ from Spätleser, 2018. I'm surprised the acidity is more muted than I would expect from the Mosul, a honeyed acidity, acidity a heavier weight acidity. Yeah, that's a function of the vintage. Um, 2018 is a warm vintage. Um, so why don't I just talk about this point now, um, which I think is very, um, which I think is a very important concept to grasp, which is this: in warm vintages in the Mosul, like 2018, like 2015, um, the dry style is easier to make and tastes better because there's more fruit, there's more generosity, the acidity is reduced, um, and the wine stops being austere and becomes a bit more generous. The Cabinet, the Spätlese, the Auschlese, in warm vintages, the problem is the acidity is already a bit diminished, and then but you still have to maintain the same levels of sweetness in the wine in order to have those categories successfully um, applied. Um, so that means that you've just got more sweetness but lower acidity, and I think that's what Edgar you're complaining of in a warm vintage. So the trick here, if you're buying German wines or if you're recommending them to your clients, is in the cooler vintages like 17, the Predicat wines, to my mind, are a bit better because the acidity is naturally higher. And in warm vintages like 15 and 18, and by the sounds of it, 19, um, those kind of vintages, the Trocken wines, the acidity is a bit more mellow because of the warmth, which means that they're less austere and they can be quite attractive. Um, okay, Nupa. Uh, he's also got Clemens Bush, um, stony citrus slate. Yeah, I think Nupa, the Clemens Bush wines are so, so slaty. Um, Clemens Bush, a great producer, and actually he labels his wines by the different types of slate that uh, he believes he has in his vineyard. He makes a red slate, a blue slate, and a gray slate. 
And of course, when you visit, guess what he does? He makes you taste them all blind, and then you tell him which state it is. And it's fine if you do that tasting at the end of the week you've just spent in Germany, because then you can taste the different slates and be confident about it. But if that's the first one you go to on Monday morning, you've got no idea what he's talking about. But so strongly do these slaty characteristics come across in the Mosul that you begin to identify even the type of slate, which is cool. Um, Amiol, high acid, apricots, sorrel, confectionery, lemon, whetstones, dry, good. Um, Acero, Dr. Lurzen, trocken, very light, citrus focus with prickly acidity. So again, a focus there on the acidity and the lightness of the wine. Uh, Luciana says dry, light, fresh, beautiful citrus and minerality. Um, uh, some people giving the alcohol levels 11.5, 12%. Has anyone got a trocken wine with more than 12%? Um, Philip, um, Cabernet 2014, smoke, petrol, high acid, low alcohol, 9.5%. Yeah, uh, Cabernet 9.5% 9, 9 would be about right. I think anywhere between 7.5, I would say that 9.5 would probably be even on the higher end, 7.5 to 9.5% uh, alcohol. Cabinet, light and racy, uh, lemon and lime, good. Okay, so um, I think that, I mean, you've just given some great and um, pretty, I think, classic descriptions of Mosul. It sounds like you've all got good examples. Interesting that some people have got Trocken, some people have got Predicate wines. Um, Germany's lightest and sweetest Rieslings, obviously in this very cool region, you're more likely to have sweet wines than from a warmer region because the ripeness levels are lower, which means that the two things, one, if you ferment the wine to dryness, you only end up with about 10% alcohol, which may not be desirable. Um, and two, you've got so much acidity, you want to leave some sugar in there to balance out um, that acid. Um, so um, the sweetest wines naturally come from the northern climates, if you think about it. If you go down to warmer climates, then um, of course, you, in every German region, they do make the Predicat wines. But my fear is that in some of the warmer regions further south, they stop being quite so balanced between the acidity um, and the sweetness. And the sweetness just feels a little, a little heavy because the ripeness is that much more. Um, and the alcohol will be higher because of that additional ripeness. Um, low alcohol, um, even for trocken, and that's the point I was asking you guys about, the people who've got trocken are saying 11.5%, 12%. And so, when you can make trocken wines, um, which you know you couldn't do in the 70s and 80s in the Mosul, but you can do now, um, and achieve 12% wine, which I think is what people are aiming for, uh, without capitalization, um, even that alcohol level is still a low level for a table dry wine in Europe. Um, so um, obviously the the Predicat wines have got low alcohol, but additionally so have the trocken wines. The acidity in this very northern climate, I think, speaks for itself. Then the genius thing that we always talk about for those people who have got the Predicat wines, this kind of balance between the sugar and the acidity. Um, and that, but I mean, I do want to qualify that. I want to put a little asterisk by that, um, which is that as someone was just saying um, with the 2018 cabinet um, in a slightly warm vintage, you might lose a bit of that tight rope. Um, balance between those two elements. Um, you know, Janice Robinson, uh, when she wrote her, her article about 2019 Germany in the Financial Times about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, she, she was talking about how great 2019 is as a vintage in Germany, both for the Trocken wines and for the Predicat wines. Um, but she says in the penultimate line of this article, published in the Financial Times, that this could be the last great vintage for Predicat wines in Germany because of the warming climate. And it was, I almost, I almost did a double take because she, you know, is not someone who goes out on limbs and makes kind of crazy unjustified statements. And to hear her saying that, that the elemental style of reasoning that so many of us associate um, unthinkingly with Germany could be on its way out, even right now in front of our eyes was a pretty wild thing to hear. Um, and I hope it's not so. I hope it's not so. Um, 
but just be aware that it is something which is being very heavily affected by climate change. Now, my own opinion is that a lot of producers in the Mosul and in other regions love making dry wines because they do want their table Rieslings to compete with the greatest white wines out there. And they don't feel that comparing a Cabernet to a Montrachet is an appropriate comparison, but a Troc and Grosses Quebec would be. So, of course, there are some historic estates which are very well associated with um, making Predicat wines, but many estates um, really who are sort of on the margins would rather make a Trocken wine if they can. And maybe we, we, we would be more sad about the demise of the Predicat wines than they would be. But just something to think about. I just put it out there for you. Um, the aging potential. I sort of say unexpected. It's not unexpected to people who know wine well, like you guys do, but um, for such featherweight light wines, the ability to go on and on and on and on in the bottle for the Predicat levels is extremely impressive with the sugar obviously acting as a form of preservative. Um, now, what I would say in addition to that though, is that the Trocken wines do not age in the same way. Um, lacking that sugar, they seem to develop much, much faster. Um, and even Grosses Quebec wines um, often seem to reach their peak around 10 years old. And they may hold for a bit, or they may just go downhill after that. So, you know, that would be another thing to consider if you are thinking about shifting your winery to making more Trocken styles. Um, in reality, I think. There are some producers in the middle Mosul where it's super cool and misty and maybe the slopes aren't facing straight south, where really it would be difficult to do anything other than make Predicat wines. But in the kind of places like on this photo where the valley is quite open and there's a lot of exposure to the sun, winemakers really have a choice about what they want to make, um, which is why at present when you go and visit a German winery, any of you who have done it will know, they make you taste all the dry wines for at first, from the most simple to all the way up to the grossest Quebec. And then you start over and taste the exact same vineyards, but just in what they call the fruity style, i.e. the off dry, sweet style. Um, and there's this sort of German sense of orderliness about it, that every wine gets made in two styles and that's what we're gonna do. But I think a lot of that is down to their choice about harvest dates and when you wanna pick and. So that could all change if they wanted to. Nicole is asking a question about this petrol. Okay, so let me just address this petrol TDN thing. So petrol is comes from a uh, an aroma particle called TDN. Um, TDN uh, occurs in wine when the grapes are sunburned or suffer from drought. So usually in hotter vintages or in hot climates. So the wines, if any, I remember my first job in wine when I was very young and we used to, at the wine merchant I worked at in the UK, Cambridge Wine Merchants, the staff used to go over to Germany and find old ladies and old winemakers who had just tons and tons of old bottles of Riesling in their cellar unlabeled. And they'd say, oh, this is from 83 and this is from 85. We don't really know what it is, but it's probably Cabernet from this vineyard. And you know, we at the wine store would say, okay, can we pay you three or four euros a bottle and we'll just take it, we'll take away, you know, two pallets worth. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. And we do it and often the wines were wonderful. We'd sell them for no money and they were just wonderful, perfumes, beautiful wines. But they almost all had this TDN note, the petrol note. But the vintages that we were drinking were the best vintages in terms of ripeness. And why were they the best vintages in terms of ripeness? Because they were the warmest and sunniest in an era in the 80s when that wasn't always guaranteed. So it wasn't an accident that we were drinking those ones because the lesser vintages like 87, 84, my awful vintage, um, would have fallen over long since. There would be no fruit left. It would just be a big acid sugar mess. Um, so the reason we keep on drinking those ones is because the fruit is still intact. Nice, warm, ripe vintage, no problem with the fruit. But the flip side of that is that the warm vintages are the ones which are more likely to have the TDN note. So in Germany, when you get TDN, it's usually a statement about vintage. But if you're in a warmer climate, TDN can just be commonplace every year. So yes, there is a lot of TDN in Australian wines, but it's just a hot place to grow Riesling. Um, and so uh, other warm climates for Riesling as well, you may see the same thing. 
uh, Alsace would be a much, much warmer climate here than in the Mosul. And you often get that note in Alsace wines as well. So it's really a, a question about the growing conditions in a certain season. But clearly, if you're in a warmer climate to start, you're more likely to get those warm, dry conditions that give rise to the TDM. So um, this is not um, specific to one region or one country or anything. It's always uh, got the potential to be there. It just depends on the conditions. The final point on this slide, I've, I've written confusions. Confusions is my word for what could you confuse this wine for? Um, and I'm just really, I mean, if you identify the wine is Riesling, then because the wine is so light, then it would be difficult to find other countries that could produce a Riesling like this um, with the complete, that super high acidity, but this very chiseled fruit and undercurrent of minerality quite hard to find. So I think you'd probably only just be thinking about other other regions in Germany, really. Um, if anyone's got any other ideas, then please share them. But I mean, I think certainly for the uh, for the Predicat wines, the Cabernet, Spätlesers, um, they're quite a unique style of wine to this region um, in terms of their featherweight sensibility, but this intensity of flavor that just reverberates around the mouth. Um, really a great contribution to the wine world. Um, Amiel, the answer to your question is about ripeness, and we're going to talk about that a lot today, so come back to me. Um, Sunny is saying, is the petrol, the TDN note, specific to Riesling, or is it found in other grapes too? Good question. I think it may be specific to Riesling, actually. Um, has, does anyone know better than I do? Um, I haven't seen that compound I don't think talked about in connection with other varieties um, maybe it's something about the makeup of the Riesling grape that uh, allows that uh, the TDN to to flourish in, in warm years okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to um, pour the next wine which we will do next we'll do the Naha wine um, and I will keep it on this slide because I want you guys to tell me what you think my points for Naha should be. Um, and let's see where we end up. Um, the interesting thing now, because we're working with the same variety, just in different regions, is that you can um, make a comparison. And I please do, I ask you to, to make a comparison to the wine that you just tasted, because that's gonna be most instructive um, way of comparing these different regions. So please pour your Naha wine and then tell me um, what wine you're drinking and you know what you think the identifying features are. And in particular, try and draw out what might be different between the Naha and the Mosul, which you just tasted. Uh, or are they really very, very similar? Um, now the Naha region, I love to put in these kind of presentations because I still think it's a bit of a forgotten, ignored, neglected region. Um, when you're in the Mosul region, you drive about an hour southwest. If you're down there by the river of Mosul, you have to drive up the windy, windy roads to get to the top um, of the slopes above the river. And then you're on the plateau. Uh, and then you drive across the plateau and then you go down the other side to get into the Naha Valley. Um, the Naha is mainly on the map because of one producer, which is very well exported, called Dernhof, uh, one of, simply one of the great producers of Riesling anywhere in the world. But there are others as well. Uh, Gut Hermansberg is right next to Dernhof, uh, great wines. And in a different part of the Naha region, Kruger Rumpf, um, making delicious wines. So I'm interested to hear what you uh, what you guys find. Um, Amber saying, Naha seems to be like a combination of the Mosul and the Rheingau. Uh, the minerality and precision of the Mosul, but with more ripeness like the Rheingau, more tree and stone fruit joining the citrus. Yeah, great. Um, so Amber's overall point being that Naha seems to be riper than what we just tasted from the Mosul. Um, still has some Mosul characteristics in terms of, as Amber says, um, minerality and precision, right? Um, but with a bit of additional ripeness, which can be detected by the fact we're transitioning from away from 
the emphasis just on the citrus to also including some stone fruits, which I love, and some tree fruits. So good. Another spectrum of flavors um, is being introduced here. Um, that's very good. Lupa, immediately riper with more stone fruit and minerality. The minerality has a different quality, more river stone than slate. And Nupa's wine is from Schlossgut Diel, D I E L, um, where my friend Caroline Diel makes the wines. So I feel bad I forgot to mention Diel in my list of good producers in the Naha. But Diel, it makes wonderful, wonderful wines. Um, the part of Familius used to run the VDP for a long time. He was the president. So very involved with um, the great estates of Germany and the legislation and setting the bylaws for what can be expected from the VDP wines, the very top wines in Germany. Um, they also make crazy stuff like sparkling, uh, sparkling wines with like 10 years on the lees and things like that. Um, super interesting estate and amazingly nice people if you ever get the opportunity to go to deal. Um, but Nupa making the same point as Amber was that it's immediately riper and in addition has got riper tasting fruit, stone fruit, as Nupa says. Um, and, you know, interesting comment, the minerality seems to have a different style. Both Amber and Nupa have mentioned that the minerality is also present, just like it was in the Mosul wine. But uh, Nupa qualifying that a little bit and saying that it's got a slightly different quality here. Um, Okay, so Sarah is with Kruger Rumpf, who I just mentioned, riper fruits, uh, very mineral slate, um, more intense flavors on the palate and slightly phenolic. Good, I love that note. So phenolic, look out for something tactile, textured, um, a little bit like tannins that you can kind of, a bit chewy, um, something a bit phenolic in the wine, in Sarah's wine, which apparently was not there in the Mosul. And more intensity of flavor on the palate, says Sarah. Um, good. Uh, Corey is in Dernhoff. Um, bigger, rounder, good acidity. But Corey making the point about the 2018s, um, they're different. Um, Corey is saying the cabinet is on the sweeter side. So Corey, I was, when I was at Dernhoff in September, we were tasting the 2018s. It was September 20, I keep on saying September, but I should say so. September 2019, I was there. So we were tasting the wines from the year before. So we were tasting the 18s. And I made the same observation that I thought that the cabinet was, one of the cabinets was quite sweet for a cabinet. And I asked, you know, what's the sweetness? And she kind of blushed and said, well, you know, we really want it to be 45, but in fact, it's 55 grams per liter in 2018. And that's exactly my point about the 18 vintage that the sugars kind of creep up there. Uh, Luciana saying that uh, the Naha is not as light as the Mosul. The citrus fruit is there, but it's riper. Good. Um, Edgar also with Dernhoff. Um, less aromatic, uh, less acidic and more body. So more body and perhaps slightly more measured, slightly, slightly less austere acidity, perhaps a bit better integrated into the fruit. Uh, good. Edgar also finding some kind of more phenolic notes uh, in his wine from the Naha than from the Mosul. Um, good, I, I think that these points are fantastic. So let me uh, see what I have to say. This uh, vineyard, by the way, is a Dernhoff um, vineyard. This is Hermann's Hölle. Um, I love it when they take you on a tour of the vineyards rather than just. Um, you know, rather than just doing the tasting, tasting is fun, but vineyards are better. And you can see how steep it is there. And this is the middle of September, uh, 2019. And look at those bunches in the bottom right of the picture. Um, very healthy crop. And I think that's why they were excited about the 2019s when we were there. And now when people have begun to taste the 2019s, indeed they have said that they, they are fantastic wines. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm also, so I, I think, you know, stylistically in the entire world of Riesling from around the world, we're in a very similar ballpark here to Mosul, there's no doubt, but like you've all said, riper. So riper fruit, but also that means more body. I didn't mention it on here, but I do think there's a bit more phenolic content as well in the Naha. Um, I don't know whether that's the skins are a bit thicker 
perhaps slightly riper, additional ripeness, maybe the skins get a bit thicker. Um, and maybe just a little touch more alcohol, half a percent here or there, depending on the style of wine that you have. But if someone told me I've got a troc and wine, it's 12.5%, that would not surprise me. Um, and so clearly there is still that tension in the cabinets and the spate lasers between the acidity and the sweetness, but it doesn't seem to be quite just walking that tightrope being so finely balanced between those two elements. It, the whole wine seems to be a bit more broad shouldered, uh, a bit more expansive. Um, okay, uh, Nupa's uh, deal is 13% for Trocken. So remember, we didn't find anyone who had a Trocken wine from the Mosul, which was more than 12%. And Nupa's saying that her deal, Trocken, is 13%. So, I mean, I think that goes to show um, we're in a slightly riper territory here. Uh, confusions, um, I'm just limiting them here to other German wine regions because I know that the wine may seem to be quite different from the Mosul one that you just tasted when you taste them right next to each other. But still, there's not many wine producing regions that can make this kind of light but intensely favored Riesling. I, th I, I think it's a very German quality. So I think the first one, the first confusion would definitely be Mosul. It's, I know it's sort of easy enough. It's not easy, but it's not too difficult when you've got a glass of Mosul and a glass of Naha right next to each other to see what the differences are. But if you had, you woke up at 10 a.m. Monday morning, here's one glass of wine. Which one is it? That's tough. That's really, that's a lot tougher. Um, Rhein Hessen. So we're not going to talk about Rhein Hessen today simply through lack of time. I had to choose four regions. If I would have added a fifth one, it would have been Rhein Hessen. So let's talk about the style of Rheinhessen um, at this point. Um, usually dry wines. Again, this is a region where you can make uh, predicates like everywhere in Germany, but dry wines are increasingly winning out here, not least because of the fantastic Grosses Gewächs Grand Cru wines um, from producers like Keller. Um, just wonderful world-class white wines, which have shown people the potential to make fully dry wines here. So. Rheinhessen generally a, a much more trocken region, um, making intensely favored, quite structured wines, um, probably with a, maybe a touch more ripeness than here, maybe 13% almost standard across the board for trocken, and maybe in a warm vintage, Grosses Gewex could get to more than that. Um, very dry, very bright acid structure. Um, um, I think just a bit more structure and authority all around the Naha, uh, just slightly bigger, uh, riper, bigger frame of acidity perhaps in Rheinhessen. Um, Rheingau, well, let's not do uh, Rheingau um, just now because we're gonna move on to that in just a sec. So we'll work backwards. We'll come back to that confusion between Naha and Rheingau in just a sec. Uh, any other comments about Naha? I mean, I, again, I do want to wave my flag for Naha. I mean, it's a very sleepy little valley for those of you who haven't been there. I mean, the Mosul is a pretty quiet river, but the Naha is much narrower. It's probably about half as wide. And the people are very nice. They probably don't see so many tourists, not so many wine tourists. And um, they're very humble, very sweet people. Um, and the wines have got this similar kind of understatement about them. Um, but they're super elegant and I just, I love to support that region all around. I love to always mention it in these discussions about great German reason. Okay, so why do you pour the wine number three? Um, moving over now to the Rheingau. Um, now, the drive from, well, there's different parts of the Naha region. Dernhof is pretty far down there. Um, so the drive from Dernhof to the Rheingau, the bottom of the Rheingau, the bottom of the steep slopes, it, as the crow flies, if you could just go straight all the way, it would be an hour, but then you've got the minor problem of having the Rhine River right in the way. Um, and there's no crossings at that part, and there's no bridges at that part. You can either go further up, or you can do what a lot of people do, which is to go on the ferry. There are car ferries. I guess you can go as a pedestrian as well. But that obviously adds a little bit of time to your experience. Um, it's a wonderful restaurant there at the bottom of the Rheingau called Sum Krug, as in like the Krug Champagne. 
some Krug, uh, which is like this dimly lit wood paneled room where they've got all these old images of the great germinal Rieslings. Like most of the stuff isn't on the wine list, so you have to talk to the sommelier and he'll tell you what to, what's available and what you can find and what he recommends. It's just a great, you know, like dark, candle lit, very, very atmospheric kind of um, gothic German experience in that restaurant. Anyway, so pour the uh, Rhine Gau wine and tell me, um, tell me your impressions. Um, think about it in connection now, not only to the Naha, but to the Mosul as well that we've tasted. And, you know, in a, in a broader context of other reasonings, perhaps from around the world or other white wines, um, what's your impressions? And please, again, tell me um, what wine you're tasting, just so I have some context for it. Um, this is the moment, I, I should have put a map in here, but I think you guys know anyway. If you don't, please, please go to your maps, your wine maps after this session and look up where these regions are, because it makes so much more sense when you can see geographically where they are. But this is sort of on the same level um, in terms of latitude, or do I mean longitude, as the Mosul. But the key difference here is this is the moment when the Rhine River, just for a short span, maybe, maybe 10 kilometers, instead of going flowing from the south to the north, it flows from east to west. And the effect of that is to create south facing slopes above the river. If you think about it, the rest of the Rhine River can't have south facing slopes when the river's running north to south. They're either going to be on the east or the west. So this is the moment when you can have south facing slopes. Um, at this moment, the bend in the river. Um, so up there, um, quite a range of different altitudes. You can have the vineyards right down at the bottom by the river where you might possibly benefit from some uh, warming um, climates, you know, from the river, a bit of insulation from the river that you often get from water bodies that are close to vineyards. Um, perhaps also the reverse in the summer, if it's too hot, a bit, a bit of cooling breezes. But you can also get estates which are much further up the hill um, and those ones um, on these steep slopes, um, you know, producers like Robert Bile, which doubtless someone will have today. Um, uh, that's much higher up in terms of altitude. Okay, so tell me what you guys are getting. Um, Edgar has got a wine from Lights. Yes, so Lights is a very important producer in the Rheingau region. Um, and I think a very good one, a big one, but I think a good one, making very reliable, consistent wines. Um, Edgar's got a cabinet. Um, Edgar commenting better balance here and integration between the fruit and the acid. So what I take away from that statement, Edgar, is that the acidity perhaps is not so shrill, um, that it seems to be maybe, if not softer, then at least the fruit seems to be generous enough that it kind of wraps up the acidity so you don't notice it so much. Um, Amiel, uh, more intense and riper stone fruit and more intense blossom. Um, Costa Eberbach, fine herb. So fine herb is like off dry, but not as off dry as Cabernet. Um, so Amiel's points, just a riper, more intense style, more stone fruit. Um, Maria has got the Robert Vial I was just mentioning. Uh, Maria says potent, powerful, full body, mineral, slaty, savory. Yeah, great, great uh, description of Robert Vial style. Which exact wine is that, Maria? Um, but I like the the emphasis here, the full body. Um, powerful mineral. So it sounds, that sounds to me like quite a dry, powerful style. Um, Amiel has got 11.5% in the fine herb. Yeah, so it's probably got about 15 grams per liter. So if they fermented that to dryness, it would be about 12.5%. The fine herb style is not really understood on the export market. So um, this doesn't really get exported, but in Germany, they drink a lot of fine herb. Um, Nice style. Uh, good for, great if you're in a restaurant. Uh, very flexible wine style, you know, 15 grams a liter. Not so much sugar that it gets in the way. Corey has got um, a cabinet, uh, bigger with less tension and acidity. Uh, nice ripe apple and cooked lemon notes. So some kind of ripe fruits, but perhaps less emphasis here on the acidity and more on the fruit, sounds like. Um, 
Amber is saying uh, Schloss Johannesburg cabinet, uh, 9.5%. So again, someone had a 9.5% cabinet from uh, the Mosul, and I was saying that would be at the top end. But I'm sort of less surprised to see 9.5% cabinet from the Rheingau, um, a slightly riper region. So even for cabinet, the alcohol gets up there a bit in a vintage like 2018. Juicy ripe apricot and peaches with lots of freshness, like biting into one ready to fall off the tree. <laughs> uh, very new worldish fruit. Um, reminds me of a Washington State Riesling, but with more freshness. So, I mean, great description there. You can tell how juicy and fruity the wine is, but while maintaining the acidity. Um, Toofy is also in uh, Robert Bile um, with a, a Grosses Cavex wine, which is great. A golden color ripe apple, apricot, and peach. Think about that panoply of flavors. That in itself is a statement about ripeness. Strong stony minerality and very concentrated medium plus body. 13% uh, for the grosses Quebec. Great structure with a steely acidity. Uh, long length and a complex finish. Beautiful and age worthy. And now Tufi, do you think that that is um, fully expressive now or do you think it's still got some time to improve or is it just in a kind of holding pattern? Um, uh, Sarah has got a Spritzer cabinet. Spritzer is another great producer in the Rhine Gap. Um, fruity rather than mineral. So interesting comment from Sarah that the emphasis in this wine is more on the fruit. Someone was saying earlier the emphasis is on the fruit rather than the acidity. Sarah is saying the emphasis is on the fruit here rather than the minerality. So in either way, the fruit is coming out on top. Um, Hochheimer. Um, some of you who read very old wine textbooks will remember that, especially in where I'm from in England, um, in like the 19th century, we used to call German wine Hock, H-O-C-K. In old books, you'll see that word Hock. The reason why we call German Riesling Hock is because of the town Hochheim, which is at the edge of the Rheingau region, um, towards Frankfurt, almost in the outskirts of Frankfurt. and um, Hochheim has got a series of south facing slopes, not above the Rhine River, uh, but above the Main, M A I N, that's the river that runs through Frankfurt, above that river, south facing slopes which get very warm. So Hochheim wines are actually quite warm, ripe wines. Um, Luciana says beautiful fruit profile, apricots. Apricots is exactly what I remember. Absolutely. Blossom notes, almost full body feeling in the mouth. Complex finish, delightful wine. Good. Um, Toofy commenting about the Grosses Quebec 2012. Remember what I was saying about, I think that Trocken wines have got less aging potential than the Predicat wines. Toofy's got 2012 Grosses Quebec from a great producer and a great vineyard. And Toofy says the wine is very good now, will gain more complexity in two to three years. So at that point, it will be 10 years old. Then keep for another five. So we're talking about a wine reaching its peak at 10 years old and then holding maybe for another five years. But, you, you know, this is really my point, um, that when you go there, if they want to show you what their grossest Quebecs can do with age, they will pull an example which is eight or 10 or 12 years old, not one that's 20 or 25 years old. So just an interesting side point there. Um, okay, so let me see what I have to say in my slide here. Um, now I want to just talk, I want to see whether, I think you can see my, um, my, my little pointer here. Just look at the pictures on the screen and you can see with my pointer, I'm circling this bridge here. So this is a super interesting picture. Both of these two pictures on this slide were taken from the same place. I literally just swiveled 90 degrees. So I love this picture here because this is a great wine picture because it shows three great wine German regions in uh, one picture. So this is the Rhine River in the middle here, running from left to right. We are standing in the rhine uh, wine region on the steep south facing slopes above the Rhine River. This town on both sides of this, of this little river here, on both sides, this is the town of Bingen. Now, on this side above Bingen over here is the Rhine-Hessen wine region. This, this you can't really tell, but that's vineyards right there above the town. And this little thing that looks like a little stream is 
the Naha River. This is where it empties out into the Rhine. And so on this side of the river is the Naha wine region, and these are vineyards here above the town. So we're standing in the Rheingau, Naha to the right, Rheinhessen to the left. Um, a really interesting moment in German wine when these three all come together. And then in the bottom picture, you can see that I've simply turned to face uh, due east now, um, facing direction from which the river flows. And look at how steep those um, sites are. Very steep, 100% reasoning vineyards going down there to the river, some of them almost on terraces. Someone had a wine from Lights. This is a Lights vineyard. Uh, we were on a, a vineyard tour with the guy from Lights when we took this picture. Um, so quite a dramatic site. And you can see, I think everyone's really having the same impression about their wines from the Rheingau, just riper than what we've been tasting up till now. And this bottom picture gives you some idea about why. South facing, steep, those grapes are getting a lot of sun, really. So many of you um, had Predicat wines from the Rheingau, which is great. But I do, I do think that the future of the Rheingau is probably going to be in Trocken wines. Um, I think that it's very easy to get that ripeness here in a way that is not true in the Mosul. Um, and it's certainly riper also than the Naha. I think, tell me if anyone disagrees with what I'm saying, but that seems to be what you were saying also from your notes. I want to make a point really of emphasizing the asset structure, um, especially for the people who've got the Trocken wines. Um, a powerful asset structure, meaning the, the structure of the wine itself seems to be stronger, more powerful. Um, this is no little light, dainty thing. This is a wine which stands up tall and straight and is happy to be here. Um, firmly structured wines, especially in the Trocken examples. And then texture, 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 um, especially in the Trocken wines again, but also in the Predicats, some kind of phenolic element to the Rheingau wines. Um, we talked about that in connection with the Naha wines as well. Um, but even more here, some tactile sensation that you can really get your teeth into, um, really adds the concentration, the body, the sense of weight and density in the wine. Um, Maria saying oily. I think oily is just fantastic for a lot of the of that phenolic sensation in the Rheingau. And I don't think anyone had that note for Mosul or Naha. I find a lot of uh, oiliness in the Rhine gal. Um, okay, confusions. Um, so a lot of people do say that Naha is a confusion for the Rhine gal, but I don't. I don't know. You tell me based on what you just tasted. I think Rhine gal to me is just a bit more of everything. I, I find it to be quite a bit more ripe. Rhine Hessen, though, I think would be a better one. You can see how close we are to Rhine Hessen right across the river. I think the Rhine Hessen wines don't tend to have so much of that oiliness. They're a bit more straight laced, a bit more pure, um, a bit more stark and spicy and pure and dry. Um, quite powerful acid structure again. I think that is consistent, but somehow more purity, the kind of oily phenolic thing stops these Rheingau wines from being totally pure. But by pure, I mean, on the sense, on the, the palate sensation is very brisk and bright. Um, there's nothing oily or um, there's no kind of solids that are getting in the way of the wine just flowing over your palate in the Rheinhessen. But maybe similar degrees of ripeness, possibly a little bit more in the Rheinhessen by half a percent of alcohol, but similar. Now, other countries, this is the first time I think that it's not uh, irrelevant to discuss other countries in the context of, of German wine. Alsace. If you would have an entry level, um, entry level Alsace wine for say 20 euros or $20 with the kind of phenolic grip, um, the kind of slaty, smoky mineral, um, and that quite powerful acid structure, I would think that's not a stupid confusion. For Rheingau, if you've got a Trocken Rheingau. Um, I don't think, I think that would be a relevant comparison. I, I, but what I would say in general though is that even though compared to the previous two wines that we've just tasted, Rheingau feels bigger, riper, more powerful all round, it's still not as powerful phenolically or in acid structure terms as Alsace is. 
Alsace is a lot further south than we are right now, a lot warmer. Um, so it's an interesting one. If, if you haven't got a trocken today, try and find a, a Rheingau trocken and compare, especially to Alsace, but Alsace is just a bit more concentrated, a bit more of everything. And Austria likewise, really, Austria has got an even more powerful acid structure and that kind of tangy, vibrant acidity that even though the acidity is bright here, I don't think it's at that level. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and pour your final wine, the wine from the Faults, or the old name for this region in English used to be the Palatinate. Uh, either way, please go ahead and pour that wine and we will talk about the Faults in just a sec. Uh, two fee, could phenolics found in the glass be linked to winemaking? Phenolics found in the glass of any wine, anywhere, any variety can always be linked to winemaking because it depends on factors like how hard you press, uh, crush, um, whether there's skin contact prior to fermentation, how much you settle the wine prior to alcoholic fermentation, whether you're happy to have some solids in the fermentation vat or not, or whether you want totally pure juice. In general terms, in Germany, um, they do a settling, a sedimentation, maybe for 24 hours um, before the alcoholic fermentation, they, they rack off um, to a different vat for alcoholic fermentation because they want super pure juice to have the purity, the crystalline purity of flavor, which, as I said at the top, is such a hallmark of German wine. Think about champagne would be a similar example. But where I think phenolics are relevant when it comes to a discussion of climate is that simply growing grapes in warmer climate means you're going to develop thicker skins. So at any point during the preparation of the grapes, you know, prior to alcoholic fermentation, you're going to have more matière, more material there to work with from warmer climates. Uh, think about a phenolic wine like Alsace, a lot, lot warmer, warmer climate than we're dealing with up here. Okay, so let's do the same with the faults. Um, tell me your impressions uh, and tell me what wine you're tasting um, and just make the comparison between these regions that you've already tasted. Um, the faults, again, quite a bit further south. I, you know, on these trips, I, I've done two of these trips now to Germany where I, you know, in one week I will do wineries in the Mosul, Saar, and Ruva, um, the Naha the Rheingau and the Rheinhessen. On one of those trips, I also went for a day to the R to taste some red wines. The R is about one hour north of where we are in, the, in these photos. Maybe a bit more, maybe an hour and a half north. Again, think about that. You're driving an hour and a half north from the Naha to get to a red wine growing region. It's crazy. Um, but then, so I did in one of these trips, I emailed some wineries in the Falks and said, look, can I come and see you? And I can't remember what happened in the end, but I, it was too far away. It was, it was at least an hour and a half's drive, I think maybe two hours from, from where we are in these pictures. Uh, straight south, of course, and uh, along the Rhine River. And uh, it wasn't worth it um, for me at that point, but that does tell a story about we're in a slightly warmer, uh, more southerly climate here. Um, the vineyards in the Falks are close to the Rhine, but they're not on the Rhine like we are here. Or they're not on the Mosul or the Naha like we are in those regions. They're stepped back by a few kilometers, um, more in the kind of Rhine general region, general area. The, um, the, the Falks region is on the slopes of what are called in Germany the Hart Mountains, H-A-A-R-D-T which are the German continuation of the Vosges mountains, which we know from Alsace. Um, so if you continue south from Faltz, straight over the French border, you get into Alsace. So the same mountain range. Um, so that's something you might want to think about as you're tasting the wine. Um, and this region really, um, they do grow many other varieties other than just Riesling. We've been in very much in Riesling land in the Mosul and Aha. Rheingau. Um, there's a few other things going on in Rheinhessen, um, but it's still quite a lot of reason. But in the faults, um, you can start to make a bit more red wine. Um, and maybe white varieties like Chardonnay or P2 
Pinot Blanc as well. Okay, so tell me what you're experiencing in the faults, similarities, differences to what has come before. Um, and also, you know, we've already mentioned Alsace in the context of Rheingau and now in the context of geography, of the geography of the faults of this part of Germany. Um, certainly think about that as well. Is that a relevant comparison? Let me uh, move this slide on a little bit. So these are my thoughts about the faults, which you might want to look at when you're tasting. You can agree or disagree with me. Either way is fine. Um, yeah, there's my mention about the heart. That's how you spell the heart, that mountain range. Um, Trocken. Well, I mean, some of you will probably have managed to find Cabernet or Spät Laser from the Phelps. Um, and then, as you can see, I think, you know, one of the really interesting things about the Phelps is that it does open the door to more wine regions that could be confused with it in the style of wines. So uh, we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, and Tufi saying, moderate intensity of ripe peach. I mean, ripe peach for Riesling, think about it. It's, it's a pretty ripe kind of fruit, isn't it? High acidity, but softer, softer acidity here. Medium body and alcohol, clear phenolics, medium length with a fresh finish, good. Um, Kathy saying pronounced aromas, noticeable tanginess and mouth-watering acidity. Um, well balanced with weightiness on the palate. So perhaps it sounds like a bit more weight and maybe a bit, quite a bit of brightness to the acidity. Uh, tropical fruit, melon, melon, that's definitely the first time we've had any kind of tropical fruit, candied fruit, hint of honey, indeed. Finishes stony, slightly saline. Um, and that's a Grossus Gebex uh, from 2013. Sounds pretty delicious. Um, yeah. Look up, look on this third, this the third and fourth bullet points here. Um, I've written bright, sunny fruit profile, and I'm deliberately using the word sunny because it both reflects, I think, the climate, of course, and the style of the wine that results. So, my point here is that this is a um, this is a warm, sunny region, just like neighboring Alsace, but the fruit itself seems to shine, seems to kind of glint with light. Um, it's very bright, and I'm reminded by that point that Kathy just made about the mouth-watering, tangy acidity, that somehow that um, bright, ripe fruit is elevated all the more by the quality of the acidity. It seems to be particularly bright. Um, now, you would think that as we come further south, well, you might have you know, less acidity or it might be better integrated into the fruit and all that. And I think all those things are true, but I also wonder whether um, whether it's possible that the acidity itself somehow is a bit riper. The acidity itself is a bit fruitier when we come to this more southern region. So um, you get more fruit in a warmer, sunnier region, but the acidity, which is still reasoning, is still there, it's still strong, um, it still is very bright and fruity itself. I don't know, it's just, I'm just putting it out there, it's just something to think about because it, there isn't, there doesn't seem to me to be in the felt a straightforward, like riper fruit, therefore acidity goes down. To me, I still get high acidity in the felt, and it seems to be particularly bright, not austere though, not hard or tough, but bright and enlightening. It really gives light to the wine. Um, Philip is saying um, darker color than the others. Uh, much darker than the 2014 Mosul, despite being four years younger, much more fruit, more peach. Acid is still solid, but lower than the others. The lime pith comes up as the wine sits on the palate. Long lime tang finish. So, you know, Philip's using words like tangy and um, what was Kathy saying? Yeah, tangy as well. So the acidity seems to have, I, I know that it may not be as piercingly high as the Mosul examples, for instance, but it seems to have a, a particularly vibrant, zesty, tangy quality to it, which is why I do include on this slide here as a possible confusion, 
um, Austria, which also has that quality. Um, I think that's not a stupid confusion at all. Um, Austria can have the kind of concentration of fruit um, and that bright, tangy acidity. I think overall, though, what I would say is that Austrian Riesling tends to be a more savory wine, a bit drier, more savory. We often talk about the earthy, peppery style of a lot of Austrian wines, and I think that would be a relevant factor. Here, I find the fruit a bit more extrovert and generous. Um, and I think overall, Austrian, the Austrian acid structure could be a really a blockbuster acid structure. And here, I know you, there is plenty of acid structure, but it's not quite at that level. I think it's closer to Alsace, um, you know, geographically that makes perfect sense. Perhaps Alsace would be a bit more phenolic. Um, strangely, you would think that there would be a bit more phenolics in Feltz than there was in Rheingau, but I don't always find that the case. I find that this to be a bit of a, a kind of whistle clean, brisk wine, um, um, which has really got pretensions to be more of a standard table wine that you could even you know, put on a table along with other different white varieties, not just Riesling, and say this is your dinner wine and everyone would be happy. You know, that's the effect of a warmer climate. Um, so Rheinhessen, of course, would be a good confusion. Um, I think those two are certainly very similar in the briskness and the brightness of the acidity. Pretty big acid structure and riper fruit, but I think Fals is riper. Fals is riper than Rheinhessen in terms of fruit, but not, not as ripe. Um, and as bright and as concentrated as Australia, I don't think. Um, and Australia, I think, has still got a more powerful acid structure than Feltz. Australia and Austria, I often think about together in the same context, but I don't think we're quite in that really powerful acid structure uh, yet uh, in the Feltz. Um, okay. So let's um, just make a few final comments about Riesling as a variety. Um, my, you know, key thing, which I always feel like I, uh, I'm a broken record about, but, you know, that a key component of terroir is climate. I think um, we've seen that, you know, pretty vividly and starkly today. The differences in terms of, you know, miles or kilometers between these regions is not huge, especially, especially between Mosul and Naha. Rheingau, but the, um, the sites and the microclimates, the aspects, the altitudes, all these things make quite different tasting wines. Um, and most, the most obvious uh, difference between them is this question of ripeness, which has come up over and over again today. Um, I have tried to line up the wines, as you can see, in an order of ripeness um, from lightest to richest. Um, I hope that your wine shows something like that. Um, if you're in any confusion, just do this tasting with all Trocken wines. Um, it's quite revealing, it's quite interesting. Um, certainly if you do that, then you get less austerity in the Trocken wines as you move through these regions, as you go from north to south. Um, in spite of that, I would you know, just make the point that we, this is quite a sort of tightly knit tasting we're comparing um, one variety from one country, but still, stylistically speaking, in the stylic, stylistic register of all the white wines in the world, there's a lot of continuity between these wines. We've seen the stark acidity of Riesling, loud and clear, um, the generous fruitiness of the wine, but always in balance. Um, and what I said at the beginning about the lightness, the essential lightness of the wine. Of course, in comparison to one another, you have wines that are richer or heavier or riper, but still these are light wines which are made light by the brightness of their acidity. You never feel anything cloying or heavy. Um, the Trocken is the future for Germany, as Jancis was saying, and as I think, and as I think German winemakers want to make as well. Um, and so it, I, I'm always a little bit confused why, you know, certain educational bodies just go on and on and on about Predicat. Um, yeah, that's important in commercial exports to especially the UK and the US markets, but it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation. Do those markets only buy those wines because that's what gets imported to them or do they buy them because they actually prefer them to the Trockens? Um, I don't know, but either way, we should be talking about Trocken more. That is where Germany is at right now in 2020, I think. Um, and 
purity, precision, freshness, balance. I mean, I think this is where the wine world is at right now. If someone has a um, wine bar, these are all the kind of virtues, um, you know, that you want um, to experience if you're trying to pair food with wine and they're all there in German reasoning. And, um, you know, it's still a, a tough sell and I, and I, know, and I know that, but um, um, just think about those points. Amiel, um, let's wrap up with this point from Amiel. Um, at this point, having scanned the four regions, would you correlate TDN with ripeness? Uh, no, I wouldn't, because TDN is not an effect of ripeness, it's an effect of sunburn and of drought and of vintage conditions. Um, and so in extreme examples, like a much hotter climate than we're talking about here, Australia, for instance, would be relevant. But people think that the main way of um, grapes getting that petrol note from the TDN is when they get sunburned. Why do they get sunburned? Because the leaves aren't covering the bunches. In cool regions of Northern Europe, like the Mosul, they remove the leaves because they want the grapes to ripen. But increasingly, they do the leaf removal in you know June, and then there's a heat wave in July, and the grapes get sunburned. But if they start leaving more of those leaves on, then um, that's gonna have an effect. So the way that you do your viticulture is gonna have a huge influence here. Um, and that is not necessarily correlated to regional differences at such a small level as we are at in Germany. But between say, you know, the Mosul and Australia, there is obviously a huge climatic difference. So that would be, uh, that would certainly be part of it, but not, I don't think at this level. Um, okay, so um, I think I will wrap that one up here. Um, I mean, this is, you, you've kind of indulged me by letting me do this session on reasoning, which is, as for so many of you, I know just a, you know, a favorite variety of mine. But um, I, you know, if we are believers in terroir, which I think we all are, um, we have to, there should be differences in taste from different places. And I think that these kind of tastings are just fascinating for seeing that uh, that you know even within quite small mileage differences to see even quite big differences in the style and taste of wines. I love that. I think it's fantastic. So the next few sessions, starting with next week when we go to France and in red wines, we're going to be talking about much bigger differences geographically, and we're going to throw in there different varieties. Um, but quite a cool opportunity, I think, to taste some varieties which you don't see every day, which might be a bit more unusual, but to get to know them, what makes them distinctive, what makes them what they are, um, and how we can compare them with others that we might naturally confuse them with. Um, okay, thank you guys um, for being with me today, and I will see you same time next week.